Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to the National Press Club, the world's leading professional organization for journalists. To learn more about the Press Club, please visit press.org, where uh, today's event will be, is being streamed live, and it's also being shown on National Press Club Live on YouTube. My name is John Donnelly, and I'm a reporter with Congressional Quarterly and Roll Call. Uh, and I'm the head of the press freedom team here at the Press Club, which leads the club's efforts to fight for press freedom and for transparency here and around the world. Uh, the Press Club's press freedom programming is run by the National Press Club Journalism Institute, which is led by Julie Hsu and uh, Kathy Kiley, our press freedom fellow. Uh, Bill McCarran, the executive director of the club, has done a great job in pulling together this event in addition to, the, to Julie and Kathy, so thank you all. The purpose of today's press conference is to spotlight the plight of Emilio Gutierrez, who is a 54-year-old Mexican reporter who sought refuge here in the United States nearly a decade ago, along with his then 15-year-old, now 24-year-old son, Oscar. He, he came here after credibly perceiving that his life was in danger in Mexico because of his reporting there. The broader purpose, so we're here to talk about Emilio's case, but we're here to talk about it also as an exemplar of a larger problem. Number one, threats that reporters face in Mexico, and number two, how our own government treats reporters and others who flee here for their lives. Incidentally, we have a petition going at change.org Look for free Emilio there, and, uh, and please, you can demonstrate your support that way. A word about the situation for reporters in Mexico. In brief, it is horrible. Uh, outside of war zones such as Syria, Mexico is arguably the most dangerous place on the planet to be a reporter right now. Since 1992, uh, scores of reporters have been killed for doing their jobs in Mexico, and 2017, which is about to conclude, is shaping up to be the worst of those recent years. Um, and, and so many, I would say most of, not I would say, the Committee to Protect Journalists and other experts would say that most of those killings have been unsolved, so they have occurred with impunity. Um, so who is killing these reporters? It is clearly drug cartels, and even though we haven't got, solved all those cases, there are clear implications that drug cartels and the Mexican government and security forces have been implicated. And even in cases when the government is supposed to be protecting reporters in a sort of witness protection program, re the reporters often get killed. That happened this year to Candido Rios Vasquez. This gives you an idea of how bad the situation is in uh, Mexico. Uh, it is corroborated by a recent report from the United Nations, which is, we have available for you all here. Um, and to draw attention to this problem, we at the Press Club decided to uh, honor uh, Mexican journalists. Every year we have what we call the John Aubuchon Press Freedom Award. We give uh, one award to a domestic recipient and, and another to a foreign uh, international recipient. This year we decided to honor Mexico's journalists collectively as a way to shine a spotlight on this. And who did we ask to come to the press club in October for our uh, formal dinner uh, with journalists, bigwigs in Washington to honor Mexico's journalists? We invited Emilio Gutierrez to come, and, and he did. And we have a, a, a clip, I believe, of, uh, of, of his appearance there. Tenemos una contabilidad de 120 periodistas asesinados. Some 120 Mexican uh, journalists have been killed. 30 desaparecidos. 30 have disappeared. Decenas de obligados a ser, a ser migrantes. Dozens have had to flee. Y otros tantos más a autoexiliarse en este país y en otros. And many others have had to self-exile either in the United States or in other countries. So there are some of the figures that I was referring to. So the situation in Mexico for Emilio Gutierrez was this. Um, he had done some reporting 
in, uh, in the uh, Chihuahua region about uh, looting, uh, robbing and extorting, uh, robbing and extortion being done by uh, military forces. And subsequent to that, they pushed him around, issued, they being the security forces, they, they get, issued veiled threats, they ransacked his home, and later he learned that he was on a hit list, okay? So that's why he left Mexico, for fear of his life. And just to give you a brief idea of the timeline, it was 2008 when he fled to the U.S. and sought asylum. He then spent nine months in detention here. Uh, and he was allowed to live here subsequently from 2009 through 2017 while his case was being reviewed. And then in July of this year, an immigration judge denied his request for asylum. The judge said he didn't have enough proof of his journalistic credentials. He said there wasn't enough proof that his life was in danger, and he even suggested that the Mexican authorities would be able to protect him, ironically enough. So he appealed that, of course, and nothing happened until November of this year when the Department of Justice's so-called Board of Immigration Appeals denied his appeal of the immigration judge's uh, ruling. So he appealed that, and he showed up uh, last Thursday at the, uh, the Im Customs and Enforcement, Immigration and Customs and Enforcement ICE office in El Paso, as he uh, is uh, supposed to do when he's appealing this. And when he, sho he, when he shows up, oh, before I forget, the, the, the uh, November Board of Immigration Appeals denial was on the grounds that he missed the deadline for, for, for filing by one day, which his lawyers contest. But it was a technicality on which, on which the appeal failed in, uh, in, in, in November. But again, his lawyers contest that, and we may hear more about that in a second. So he shows up last Thursday at the ICE office in El Paso, as he's supposed to do, and then customs agents, in apparent violation of the rules, say they're going to deport him. And they start taking him to the border. And it's only because his lawyer was able to get uh, some people on the phone very quickly that he was not uh, sent across the border. But uh, they then uh, handcuffed him and put him in jail. And that's where he is right now. Um, he is with his son, by the way, in a, a jail in a town called Sierra Blanca, which is about 90 miles from where his uh, lawyer works in El Paso. Um, and that's where he is right now. And I think there we have a shot of, uh, of that facility. It's in a very remote area of, of Texas. So um, we have with us today, thank goodness, we have Eduardo Beckett on the line. And he is the attorney with the Beckett Law Firm who is representing Emilio. Eduardo, are you there? Yes, uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon, and thank you very much for, uh, for, for joining us. Um, and we also understand, is this correct, that Emilio is uh, able to listen into this press conference right now from the, from the detention facility? That, that is correct. I, uh, I, uh, he's listening as we speak uh, uh, on speakerphone. Okay, great. Well, I hope he hears that round of applause. I hope he recognizes that he's not alone, um, and that's why we're doing this. We're trying to draw attention to his case. So um, I wanted to give uh, you, Eduardo, a chance to sort of fill us in on if there's any new developments or anything you want to add to the timeline that I just described. Uh, no, your timeline's uh, right on the money. Uh, the only thing I would add is that uh, Emilio uh, told me that, uh, you know, he's, in a, he's depressed, very sad. Uh, he says that he witnesses uh, daily abuses by immigration officials at Cerro Blanca. Um, uh, the, the, the other thing that we found out is that uh, when he was detained uh, in handcuffs, that the immigration officials told him, uh, uh, before we take you over, some Mexican government officials are going to come interview you. Um, and then I confirmed that uh, the normal deportation process involves um, uh, Mexican government officials uh, from the consulate's office will interview a person like Emilio, get his biographic information, and then turn that information over to Mexican immigration authorities. Um, so Emilio uh, was telling me that he was terrified, and he continues to be terrified, that uh, basically the U.S. government, uh, through the Mexican government, is basically telling them, here's Emilio Gutierrez, 
uh, a critic of the uh, of the Mexican government were deporting him uh, at the exact date and time of his deportation. Uh, so that's something new that we learned uh, in this process. Okay. So you mentioned abuses that he's witnessed there in the facility. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, he was saying that the food is, is terrible, you know, that it doesn't fill you up. Uh, it's isol isolation. They don't get a lot of free time to walk around, to go outside. It's the middle of nowhere. And so he says that it, it, it's a type of prison that can uh, make you go crazy. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, but that he's willing to, to suffer whatever it takes and, and he asked me to do everything I can to, to get him released. And I think that's the first and foremost important thing to do is get him released while the uh, appeals process continues. Um, but basically, you know, uh, they have inferior medical uh, treatment, uh, basically bare minimum uh, and bare minimum food. Um, I guess the only good thing they did was the, they allowed him to call me and he was able to talk to you all, but that's, that's the only good thing uh, in that facility. So do you have any idea sort of how long this process might take? What comes next? I would uh, ask, uh, you know, first of all, thank you all for supporting Emilio Gutierrez. I think right now the most important thing is to try to get him out before his health deteriorates, you know, based on his age. He's not used to being, you know, uh, basically treated like a prisoner. Um, this process uh, could take months, um, it, even if the – Board of Immigration Appeals uh, reopens his case. The case is going to continue. That could take more months uh, in order for the judge to issue a new decision. So we're talking that he could be detained anywhere from six months, even up to a year. Um, so this is a very long process, and I think uh, we need to get him and his son out as, as soon as possible. I also believe in good faith that this is a tactic by Immigration Customs Enforcement to send them in the middle of nowhere so that he can give up. They're pressuring him, saying, we're going to silence you. They might not say it, but their actions show it. Mm -hmm. Well, there was, a, there was a, another case this year of uh, Martin Mendez, who um, had spent months in detention while he was awaiting an answer on his own plea for asylum. And uh, in, in co the conditions in his detention, he described as hellish. And basically, he just got so sick of being in detention that he gave up and he returned to Mexico, and he is now in hiding in Mexico. So he left Mexico for fear of his life, but he preferred to go back there and go into hiding to stay indefinitely in the detention center. So that's an, that's an example of where, you know, whether it was their intention or not, the effect was to basically, you know, say you know, basically put him in an awful situation indefinitely and force him to make the decision to go back. And, but you, you believe that this is sort of a, uh, a modus operandi then, right? Yeah, uh, correct, yeah. I mean, they could have easily detained him here. Uh, uh, the detention center, uh, 8915 Montana, which is El Paso Detention Center, is within like 10 minutes of my office. Uh, they have the space. Uh, they could have easily left them there, but they decided for unknown reasons to take them 90 miles away. I think it's done purposefully. Let me tell you how bad it is. I've seen federal uh, 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 persons who have been sentenced by the federal court um, beg the court, please get me out of Sierra Blanca. This is a transient jail. Um, I can't take it anymore. Uh, give me time credit just for being here. So that's how bad it is. People are begging to, to go to a real federal prison instead of being detained at Terra Blanca. That's how bad it is. And I've seen some of those motions uh, filed in the federal court. So that uh, uh, clearly uh, it's a bad prison. Uh, and I believe this was done on purpose uh, to show, you know, that ICE is the boss. And they, they, they make the rules in, in hopes that Emilio will just give up, but he's not going to. And uh, if you want, I'll ask him to tell you directly how he feels, and I can translate. Oh, yeah, sure. I didn't know that was an option. Yes. Please, please yes, do. Yeah. Uh, Emilio, uh, aquí tengo uh, 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 muchos uh, reporteros. ¿Qué les quiere decir usted en sus palabras? Por favor. Por favor, no. No nos dejen. No dejen de publicar la situación que estamos pasando. No dejen de publicar los, terror los terroríticos. 
México, que es trabajar de una manera libre el periodismo en México. Ok, espérese. He's saying, please, please, do not forget us. Do not forget, do, do not forget to publish uh, the pain, uh, terrifying uh, situation that I'm in and, and the terrifying manner in which journalists have to work in Mexico. ¿Qué más, Emilio? Si nos fijamos, los únicos que no tienen atentados son los que, son los que trabajan para los medios que sirven al gobierno o a los grupos criminales, que es lo mismo. He el say, gobierno es el grupo criminal más grande de México. He's saying that the only journalists in Mexico who are, can do their job and report freely are the ones that work or benefit the government or criminal organizations. ¿Y qué era la otra parte, Emilio? El gobierno es el crimen organizado. He also says that he believes that it is the Mexican government who is no, the, the criminal organization. No habría grupos alternos en el crimen sin la autorización del gobierno. He's saying that criminal organizations would not exist with such power if it wasn't for the permission by the Mexican government. ¿Cómo se siente usted, Emilio? I'm asking him how does he feel. He says, I am depressed. Practically, we have spent our time in bed. For example, I have not received my medications. The food is gross. We have no other alternative. So bad that he's thinking that of doing a hunger strike because his beliefs are stronger than the arbitrary conditions and the arbitrary process that he's going through, and that if he has to do a hunger strike and refuse to eat all food, that he will do that based on his principles. ¿Qué era la otra parte, Emilio? Si me tengo que poner en una huella de hambre total. So he's saying, if I have to submit myself to a total hunger strike, I will. Our moral principles is bigger than the criminal procedures as to how they are treating us. And we will not give up. This process, our life is dependent on this process. And I ask all of you, please do not leave us, do not abandon us. Please, please. I just want to share something at, at, at this point, just to let him know that we are getting some attention to this issue here in Washington. The Washington Post did a story on Saturday about this, uh, about Emilio's situation. Um, and uh, we just got a statement today from a member of Congress, uh, Don Beyer, a Democrat from Virginia, who says that uh, Emilio's appeal for asylum is exactly why we need to protect people who are seeking asylum in this country. Quote, Mr. Gutierrez is a well-known journalist who faces a clear and present danger should he return to Mexico. I implore ICE to reconsider its decision to deport him, close quote. Feel free to translate that or paraphrase it for uh, Emilio. 
Uh, Emilio, dice que, que se ha reportado, ellos están haciendo muchas cosas por usted. Salió uh, su historia en frente del Washington Post, ¿verdad? que es un periódico muy importante nacional y que un congresista uh, local uh, o senador este, está diciendo que lo va a apoyar 100% y que el caso suyo es el, el gran ejemplo por qué tenemos asilo para defender la libertad de expresión uh, de, de, un, de los reporteros y que usted está muy conocido y básicamente que lo, lo va a apoyar 100%. Oh, muchas gracias. Le agradezco mucho. Thank you, thank you so much. I want to ask another question, and I'm going to throw it open to the, uh, to the audience here shortly. Um, you know, you reading over the, the judge's decision from July, uh, he questioned whether or not you really face a threat, you, Emilio, really face a threat in Mexico. So I would like, if possible, I would like you to briefly tell us why you fear for your life in Mexico. Briefly tell us what happened so that we can hear from your words directly uh, what the danger is. Uh, Emilio, el, el dice que el juez de inmigración aquí del Paso, en su decisión, dijo que usted no corría peligro uh, a regresarse a México. Y él, la pregunta para usted es que usted diga en sus mismas palabras por qué ahorita usted tiene miedo regresar a, a México. Uh, si los puede decir algo breve eh, en cuestión de eso. Porque el grupo criminal más grande es el gobierno. Y yo he estado señalando el gobierno. The biggest Entonces, criminal ¿sí? group in Mexico is the government, and I've been sing singling the government. ¿Ok? Siga. Tenemos, al menos yo tengo terror pisar un pie en México. I am terrorized to step foot in Mexico. No quiero regresar nunca más a México. I don't ever want to return to Mexico. Y no voy a regresar a México. And I refuse to return to Mexico. Uh, Emilio, pero ¿por qué exactamente? O sea, uh, el juez está diciendo que usted no corre peligro. ¿Usted qué dice de eso? Ojalá fuera, ojalá y este huevón fuera un fin de semana a Ciudad Juárez y se quedara en un hotel y saliera a visitar las calles para que se dé cuenta por qué no podemos regresar. Ok, espérame. Uh, Emilio uh, says that he wishes that the judge in El Paso would visit Ciudad Juárez personally and spend a weekend in the streets of Ciudad Juárez and witness for himself the conditions in Mexico and perhaps then he would realize why Emilio could not return to Mexico. Mire usted como un ejemplo. Después de que yo estuve el día 4 en el National Press Club por invitación de ellos, al día, al tercer día, mataron a un compañero. Y hasta este momento, de los 121 asesinatos de periodistas, ninguno, ni uno solo ha sido solucionado. Ni uno. Emilio says that... No puedo regresar a México. Uh, no tengo confianza en las autoridades. He has no confidence in the authorities, and he, by example, he said, after he was invited by the National Press Club, uh, uh, when he was presented with the award, uh, subsequent to that, uh, a journalist in Mexico w was, was executed, and, and um, he also mentioned that over all these hundreds of journalists who have died in, in Mexico, not one person has been arrested or prosecuted Therefore, he says that he has no confidence whatsoever uh, in the Me Mexican government system to basically seek justice for, for journalists. Can he say exactly what they did to him, the security forces? I, I know what I've read, but I'd like to hear it from him directly. Okay, uh, Emilio, él dice que él ha leído su historia, pero él quiere saber exactamente qué le hicieron los Uh, los oficiales del gobierno de seguridad a usted, exactamente. Exactamente. Publiqué tres, tres notas en donde señalaba a elementos del ejército mexicano okay, haciendo pero... asaltos a la ciudadanía. I exactly what I did was I published 
three reports where I singled out uh, Mexican uh, military assaulting. Uh, ¿Qué más, Emilio? Asaltó. A la, a la ciudadanía. ¿Pero qué más dijo? As ¿Asaltaron y qué más hicieron? Asaltaron a la ciudadanía. En, ¿Cómo en... motivó que el secretario de la Defensa Nacional enviara a un general, Alfonso García Vega, a amenazarme con que no iba a escribir un artículo más, o bien que me atuviera a las consecuencias. Después, allanaron nuestra casa y nos destruyeron nuestra casa. Posteriormente, noté la vigilancia que tenía y cómo me pude escapar para después saber que exactamente que me iban a asesinar. So, in a nutshell, what he's saying is that he published three reports criticizing uh, Mexican military forces, in particular the Mexican military, uh, as to uh, assaulting, robbing the Mexican citizens, and that uh, a general was summoned uh, and threatened him face-to-face, -face, telling him to stop publishing those stories. So he's basically being pu punished for publishing the truth, and that he was uh, basically threatened not to publish such stories, and then subsequently uh, they entered his house and destroyed it and, you know, without a warrant and basically just made up a pretext reason. And so that's the exact reason why he came to the United States. And then he heard that his name was on a hit list. Is that correct? Dice que si usted oyó que su nombre está en una lista para asesinarlo. Una lista no, pero sí la amenaza directa del general Alfonso García Vega. So he's saying not a list, but that he was threatened directly by a general Alfonso García Vega. García Vega. Pero, El coronel Ildefonso Martínez Piedra. And another colonel also threatened him. ¿Y quién le dijo a usted que lo iban a matar? Una amiga mía. Ella tenía un primo que estaba trabajando para las fuerzas especiales del ejército y estaban estaban este, acuartelados en la zona militar de Puerto Paloma. Y cuando él se dio cuenta, le avisó a su prima y su prima me puso sobre aviso. Y ella misma nos llevó a escondernos en un rancho. So he said that, so he had a, a friend who had a a uh, family member that was in special forces, uh, Mexican military, and that he confined. Okay, I guess we lost him there. Um, well, while we're trying to get him back, um, I'll just mention a, a few other things. Um, I mentioned the case of Martin Mendez. Um, the, uh, the reporter who gave up and went back to Mexico and who's now in hiding. Well, we spoke to him uh, at an event that the Press Freedom Committee uh, and the Journalism Institute put on uh, a few months back, and uh, we heard about his situation. And before we talked to him, we viewed a film that I would recommend to you all called El Paso by Everardo Gonzalez. Uh, if you want to get a feel uh, for what it's like for uh, Mexican reporters uh, trying to seek asylum here in the United States. Um, and I just, uh, I just want to make a couple observations. Uh, first of all, it's stunning that he is uh, uh, talking about doing a hunger strike. Um, that, that indicates, obviously, the seriousness with which he takes it, and we take it with equal seriousness, uh, but he's the one who's going to have to go through that if he chooses to do that. A um, couple things I wanted to say was, um, you know, reading that judge's order, uh, decision, excuse me, and then listening to his version of events, it is, it is striking the burden of proof that uh, someone seeking asylum has when they come here. It seems to me it's virtually unattainable. If, if, he, if he can say that the named officers in the Mexican military uh, made threats to his face, how much more proof do you have to show an, uh, a judge, an immigration judge, 
that your life is in danger? Do you actually have to have a bullet in you before they believe that you are in danger? Uh, that is that strikes me uh, as somebody who doesn't ordinarily cover immigration uh, that this is a, an incredibly high burden of proof. Um, and and the other thing that the judge said was he questioned his journalistic bona fides. Well, um, tw twenty plus media and press freedom organizations have spoken out on behalf of Emilio Gutierrez. We chose Emilio Gutierrez to come receive the uh, John Obershawn Press Freedom Award on behalf of Mexican journalists in, uh, in our October dinner, okay? So we don't question his journalistic bona fides. And so I just want to read to you real quickly who these organizations are. Okay, as a way, number one, of thanking them for their support, but number two, and ask yourself as you're listening to these names of these organizations, do they all have it wrong? Do they all have it wrong that he's, that he's not a real journalist? Uh, the Press Club, the Press Club Journalism Institute, Military Reporters and Editors, which I am pres president of, Radio, Television, Digital News Association, Reporters Without Borders, Society of Professional Journalists, Society of American Business Editors and Writers, National Press Foundation, National Association of Hispanic Journalists, National Association of Black Journalists, National Press Photographers Association, Pan America, Asian American Journalists Association, Writers Guild of America East, the Alicia Patterson Foundation, I'm almost done, Center for Latin American Studies at University of Arizona, Online News Association, American Society of News Editors, Association of Alternative News Media, Committee to Protect Journalists, Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press. I don't think they all have it wrong, okay? And I want to thank all of them for their support. Um, do we have any uh, luck uh, getting them back on the line or not yet? Okay. Um, let me get a show of hands for people who want to either ask me, a, first of all, who would like to ask me a question, since I'm available, and then secondly, for who wants to ask Emilio and his attorney a question. Anyone want to ask me a question? Okay. Did the immigration judge give an indication of what would convince him that Emilio is a journalist? Uh, let me re repeat that question, and I'm, I'm, I'm uh, I think uh, Eduardo, and, and first of all, thank you for getting back on the line with us. Uh, and is Emilio still there? Yeah, he, we're, we're here. We just got cut off for some. Oh, okay, great. Uh, we just got a question uh, from the audience about <laughs> what do you think that judge in July? was looking for in terms of proof uh, of, of Emilio's journalistic uh, credentials? So I summary? think, you know, uh, the judge, whether or not he's a journalist, I mean, the judge knows that he's a journalist. I guess what the judge is saying in a nutshell, he's saying um, that he wants the lady, the, the friend who told him you're going to be killed, to, to either come testify in person um, or to write an affidavit. Uh, to those circumstances, what the judge doesn't understand, though, is, is that sometimes people in Mexico, when you ask them, come testify or give me an affidavit, they get scared. They don't want to cooperate anymore because they live in Mexico. And then when it's a case against the government, they don't want nothing to do with it because they fear for their life. And in this case, I think that's what happened. Uh, I, if I understand correctly, uh, Professor uh, Molly Malloy went down there personally to go uh, – uh, try to get an affidavit from this lady, and the lady was was uh, saying, "Oh, I, I can't help you. I can't help you. Uh, you know, I, I don't want to die and stuff like that." So I think, you know, the judge is uh, basically wanting something like that. But but I also think that the judge, just because I do so many cases before him, he minimizes, discredits most asylum seekers, and minimizes. Uh, the, the levels of corruption in Mexico and how dangerous it is. Um, so this is nothing new for me. This is a, uh, a way for the judge to get rid of a case. It's just to basically try to minimize the asylum seeker, try to find something, hold on to it, and then he washes his hands. This is what he did in this case, in my opinion. Okay. The lady you're talking about, that was a, a lady who had heard that his name was on a hit list, right? Correct. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Correct. So there was a report of him being on a hit list. 
Um, but the question really, and the thing I was just referring to is I, I, you may not have heard, I was reading all the different uh, media and press freedom organizations that are supporting Emilio and who don't have any questions about whether he's a journalist. You said the judge doesn't question whether he's a journalist, but when I read that, the judge's decision, he had all kind of questions about uh, article, you know, why couldn't uh, Emilio produce this article or that article? So he was kind of challenging his, uh, his journalism, wasn't he? Yes, yes. Uh, so I stand corrected. I, in, uh, in fact, uh, I believe that uh, the judge asked Emilio, how many articles have you written? You know, and, and Emilio was like, I, you, know, you know, lots of articles, but the judge was, no, no, I'm talking about how many articles have you written against the Mexican military? And Emilio was like, well, you know, several. Um, so then the judge was like, well, I only see one. Uh, where's the rest of them at? And uh, Emilio wasn't able to get the rest of them for unknown reasons. And so the judge used that to say, well, maybe I don't believe you. Maybe you only, re you know, you only wrote one. You can't get the other ones. Why can't you get the other ones? Well, he doesn't understand either that sometimes in Mexico, you know, if something's written at the local level, it's not going to be published at the national level. And, and, and it's very hard. You know, I've, I've had the experience personally when, when I've asked uh, the Dario from Juarez, hey, can you authenticate this report that came out on this day? They tell me, bring me a federal court order. And I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm asking you something simple. I'm not telling you, you know, and, and, and so they won't cooperate. And so I think that's what we're dealing down, uh, with is that uh, uh, my understanding is that we did find some more articles. Uh, we did send them to the uh, Board of Immigration Appeals. Um, we were able to gather some more. Uh, uh, so basically, uh, Emilio is telling the truth, but the judge used that to discredit him or find him incredible. Of course, all it takes is one article to have your life uh, threatened. Uh, but that this too is sort of a technicality. Just like, did he miss the did he miss the the, the filing uh, by a day, or does he have one article or five articles? These are pretty small potatoes kind of issues when there's such a but huge principle involved here. Um, Correct. So let's, any other questions from the audience? Yes. Uh, can Eduardo talk a little bit about the third party, oh, sorry, third party options and uh, third country options and uh, other immigration uh, choices? Did you hear that question, Eduardo? Uh, sure. So, you know, that's going to be uh, entirely up to Emilio. Uh, uh, he did tell me that uh, under no circumstances can he return to Mexico, but that he's willing, you know, to be, if he gets accepted to Peru or Spain or another country, he'll, he's willing to to uh, to take those offers. Um, but uh, you know, in, in my perspective, we really want him to to stay here. Uh, but of course, that's always an option um, uh, for, for him to go to a third uh, country if they accept him. Of course, um, my understanding is that uh, Peru um, won't do anything affirmatively as, as as of right now. But they will. They said if he flies in. Uh, from Mexico, then we will accept him and take him in. But it has to, uh, he has to fly from Mexico, and, and that's the whole thing we're trying to, uh, to avoid. I see, uh, a, him. I see a problem in that situation, yeah. Follow-up question. Well, isn't it also an issue that uh, he's out of status now, so we've had him for, he's been here for eight or nine years, and he doesn't have a valid passport, right? So he can't, even if he, even if he could go to Mexico and they let him go, he doesn't have a a passport to travel. Correct, correct. And it, it puts him in a bind because on the one hand, he's saying, I fear the Mexican government. On the other hand, uh, the, it would be a, a contradiction for him to go to the Mexican government, the same government he's fearing, give me a passport, help me. Um, you know, so it's a contradiction. Yeah. Other, <coughs> do we have other questions? One in the back. Uh, this is a question submitted online from the Associated Press. Um, do he or Emilio feel like the U.S. and Mexican governments are working hand-in-hand -hand to expedite Emilio's removal from the United States, either because of his reporting or the adversarial attitude both governments have at times taken toward reporters? Did you hear the question, Eduardo? Yes, uh, and I'm going to have to say yes in my professional opinion. Um, you know, I think that the, the U.S. Uh, turns a blind eye to the realities on the ground of Mexico, especially when it comes down to the levels of corruption. So I think it benefits uh, Mexico to basically silence Emilio, deport him, 
uh, you know, basically shut them up, and then the U.S. gets, you know, basically just gets rid of rid rid <laughs> gets rid of him. So I, I, I'm going to say yes to your question, just based on on my experience and 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 the stuff that we see, the political climate. Uh, I'm going to say yes. And I just have a brief follow-up. Um, is Emilio's case an outlier, in your opinion, or are Mexican journalists seeking asylum in the United States commonly held in detention or denied asylum? And has that changed this year? Well, well I don't, I, don't think, I think his case, uh, I think he stands on firm ground, and I think his, he should have been granted asylum. I, I, I think that um, other Mexican journalists have come to El Paso and, and asked for asylum, and it has been granted. Um, so I'm not going to say his case is an outlier. I just think that, that the judge, for some reason, is washing his hands and minimizing it. And, 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 and I think that uh, it is very common, though, for any asylum seeker, whether a journalist or not, to be detained. This is just the, the, the U.S. policy and process. And I think it's uh, worse now under President Trump. Um, you know, uh, basically, the, the humanity uh, has gone down the drain. There is no more humanity. And I think the new tactic is uh, we'll pressure you, we'll keep you detained in hopes that you give up, and then we don't even have to uh, worry about you anymore. Uh, I think that's a tactic by the Trump administration. That's my professional opinion. Do you think that the – I was observing when, when you were uh, – your phone line was cut off that it seems to me that the burden of proof on somebody seeking asylum is incredibly high uh, in terms of being able to document uh, uh, the threat that they face. D is, do you share that view? Uh, you know, the U.S. Supreme Court has said that an asylum seeker only has to show a 10 percent chance that you may be persecuted upon deportation, in this case to Mexico. 10 percent chance. So. The burden of proving an asylum case shouldn't be that high, but I believe that under this administration and the judge, uh, they make it so impossible. Uh, when you're being persecuted, you know, you're not going to go to your persecutor and say, hey, by the way, you know, I'm going to ask for asylum in the U.S. Would you write me a letter and tell the good judge that you, you want to kill me and you're going to torture me? I mean, and that's really what the judge is trying to get, something that he can't get. And, and so I think that the judge is going out of his way to make it harder than what it is. I mean, this is a straightforward case. Um, he should have been granted asylum. Uh, but unfortunately, our, our uh, immigration judges, uh, that's a big problem around the nation, especially here in El Paso. If you look at the stats, we have one of the highest denial rates in the country. I believe the judge in particular, over 98 percent of asylum cases denied. Um, so these are all... Uh, tools that the U.S. government uses to, to basically dissuade people from asking for asylum. Okay. Uh, we have another question for you. Another question submitted online uh, by Lee Hochstetter of the Washington Post editorial board. By what means has Mr. Gutierrez been supporting himself here in the United States? So uh, his son works at a restaurant. Uh, Mr. Gutierrez himself had a uh, food truck and he was selling food. And uh, so he sells food. Uh, I, I do know that his food truck uh, broke down recently. Uh, he was trying to fix it, but that's that's the way uh, he gets by. Uh, so he's not, you know, no longer really a, per se working as a journalist. Uh, although I think he is, because I think he has continued to criticize the government, Mexican government, from from inside the U.S. You know, in, in safety. Um, but that's his uh, main way to to eat was was a food truck. So he went from being a journalist to selling tacos on the street, basically. Um, I also want to ask you, does, uh, does Mr. Gutierrez have any kind of criminal record? I, absolutely not. Uh, no criminal history whatsoever in the U.S. Never been arrested for anything. Uh, his son, no criminal history whatsoever. Um, I mean, these guys are... are, are, are uh, Persons that uh, are not a danger to the community, are not a threat threat to public safety, or a threat to national security. There is no good reason why the U.S. government or Immigration Customs Enforcement uh, should detain them. Uh, really, I mean, they they also have a big support system in Las Cruces, New Mexico. I'm talking about, you know, professors, lawyers, 
former U.S. attorneys um, that uh, are, are part of a group in Las Cruces who have been assisting Emilio to make sure that, that you know, he's got food on the table, that he's stable, uh, and, and, and et cetera, et cetera. So there, there's really no excuse for the government to do what they're doing to him. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Yes, one, one more, at least one more. There, uh, Eduardo, yes, uh, yes, I, ICE put out a statement, and there seemed to be a discrepancy between where they say Emilio crossed the border and where everything else we read about him says he crossed the border. So I just wonder what you thought about that, and if, uh, you know, does that raise a question about whether they have him possibly, do they have the right guy? Is he con are they him confused with somebody else? Uh, well, you know, in my practice, I think that uh, the government makes a lot of mistakes uh, on their reports, uh, but uh, we know 100% for sure he came in through New Mexico, never through Texas. He turned himself in at the port of entry in New Mexico. Uh, the ICE has uh, recently made a statement saying that he came in through Favens, Texas. That is in incorrect, um, but very typical for immigration to make mistakes. Um, and uh, uh, that's a big problem because that little mistake, right, as you say, they could uh, make a mistake and say that, that you're a wanted felon when you're not. Uh, so so there is a lot of human errors or, or clerical errors on the part of uh, the Department of Homeland Security because they're so massive. And a little mistake of when he filed his, uh, his uh, uh, case apparently also loom, looms large here, a mistaken uh, – uh, claim by the government, in your opinion, right? Yes. The so the the he had to file his notice of appeal within 30 days, and it was sent on the day that it was due. But but the question remains is that the judge never mailed the decision to the prior lawyer. They also had the wrong address of the prior lawyer. So in my opinion, you know that those are big mistakes by the court. Um, so they should, they should have accepted his appeal because there's mistakes on, on the address. It was never mailed. But yet the Board of Immigration Appeals to say, no, we, we don't have jurisdiction because it, you know, it didn't come on time. So I think that's a larger issue. You know, why, why does the Board of Immigration Appeals not allow for you to file an appeal through email or electronic format or even fax? Um, those are all big issues that, if you look at the process, it is stacked against immigrants, period. Right. One more. Another question uh, submitted online uh, from the Associated Press. Since his departure, and particularly in the last few months, has Emilio heard from sources in Mexico that his life specifically remains in danger? Let me ask, ask him directly. Emilio. Desde que usted ha estado en Estados Unidos, ¿usted ha oído, eh, no ha oído de, de colegas en México que todavía lo andan buscando uh, o, o lo están esperando? Sí, sí, claro. De, deme un ejemplo. Mire, después de que, después de que yo vine, a, de que nos eh, buscamos el asilo político, asesinaron al a Choco Rodríguez Carrión, Armando Rodríguez Carrión. Asesinaron al gallito, al gallito Miranda en Nuevo Casas Grandes. Después de ahí, todas las personas que me han conocido, políticos, amigos, este, incluso el hijo del dueño del periódico en el que trabajaba, que se llama Gerardo Rodríguez, Hola. me dijo, ojalá vengas porque aquí se están esperando. Yo demandé el periódico, por, por, me, despidieron, me despidieron, después de haber trabajado también en el paso para la misma empresa. Yo los demandé y el abogado de la empresa me dijo, dígale Emilio, le dijo a mi abogado laboral, dígale Emilio que se desista de la demanda, porque lo van a reportar y aquí lo van a estar esperando. Okay, ¿Cómo se llaman los reporteros que mataron? Armando Rodríguez y el otro, ¿cuál era? Rodríguez Carrión y, y este 
Y Norberto Miranda Madrid. ¿Oberto o Huberto? Norberto, Norberto Nor Miranda Madrid. Inmediatamente después de que nosotros solicitamos el asilo aquí. Okay, espere. Uh, so let me try to answer your question. Okay, I'm sorry about that. Um, so basically, uh, I'm, I'm going to do it in a nutshell, right? Because a lot of uh, he speaks really fast. And my translation is kind of slow. So he says that when he came to the U.S., subsequent to his coming to the U.S., a reporter named Armando Rodriguez and Norberto Miranda. Uh, Madrid, Madrid, Madrid uh, were, were was assassinated, and that former colleagues of his, uh, people that he worked with, you know, over the years, you know, like local uh, politicians, people that he knew, told him, "Hey, if you ever come back, man, that's going to happen to you." You know, basically saying, "If you ever come back." He also said really briefly that he, he used to work for the Dario. Uh, and that he subsequently, when, you know, because he couldn't work for them anymore in Mexico, that he was he was fired. So he also said that he uh, filed a, a suit against them, and and that the that his lawyer they were trying to settle the suit, uh, and that the lawyer for the Dario told his lawyer that you know he told Emilio to withdraw his lawsuit because he basically he already knows that when he comes over here. You know, he, got, he has a death sentence. They're waiting for him. So to answer your question, multiple uh, different people have told him that upon deportation that he's going to be killed. La mayoría de las personas que me conocen y que conocieron mi trabajo me han dicho, si te hubieras quedado, ya no existes, ya no existirías. And, and he says that m the majority of his colleagues have told him, if you would have stayed, you would no, no longer be living. Basically, you would be dead. You would have stayed in Mexico. So does that answer your question? Yeah. Yes, it does. Thank you. Any other questions? OK, it looks like we are uh, out of questions at this point. Um, and so I suppose we'll wrap it up, but not before uh, saying thank you uh, to uh, both Emilio and Eduardo. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for standing up for principle. And we want you to know, in case you haven't gotten the picture yet, we are with you 100%. And uh, we're going to stay on this case. So uh, buen suerte. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you. My pleasure. Well, th thank you all. Uh, I just want to reiterate the, 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 our petition uh, on change.org is uh, free, Emilio, and you can find it there and express your support. We have copies of the UN report uh, available here if you want to take a look at that. And uh, we're available for any one-on-one uh, -on -one questions if you'd like afterwards. Uh, thank you very much for joining us.